Okay, so we're on this preparation time of leading up to Christmas celebration. And uh, last week, uh, Chris brought a message about uh, our will and, and how God can work um, in our intentions and our will. And uh, um, my assignment, he assigned me this, uh, is, is today is to talk about expectations and how uh, uh, God can be uh, working even in our expectations. And, I thought, why me? You know, I mean, I, I, I lower expectations. So that, <laughs> well, it's a small hurdle to step over, you know. But um, uh, there is something about the expectancy of uh, coming towards Christmas. And, um, and I actually uh, think that it's probably a pretty important way that we do prepare uh, to receive Christ as, as, as Christ breaks into our world in a really radical way. Christmas uh, and uh, shakes everything up and uh, and transforms us in the in the process. And if we believe that's true, then then our expectations have a lot to do with it. Now, the, the how many of you have really high expectations about things? <laughs> this side, mostly this side. Oh, yeah. Uh, the the man who, who was the owner of the Orlando Magic basketball team and the founder of Amway, I found a quote from him last night that. Uh, we need to raise our expectations to the highest level or we'll never achieve anything. I thought, cool, I could own the Orlando Magic. <laughs> but then I'd be there, you know. But anyway, uh, but then I thought, I don't know, because some of us, we get, I don't think anybody's born with expectations. It's more that uh, we've learned along the way uh, what our limits are and what our possibilities are. So uh, I need to tell you, you know, my Christmas story because, um, and, and you've probably heard it many times, um, because I only have one. Um, we'd come back from Africa, and you know, Santa never found us in Africa. I just want you to know that. About three months later, a boil drum came with gifts from the grandparents, mostly used clothing. Uh, but. Um, so we got back to the States, we're living in Whittier, and, and I was ready, I was so good, and uh, I was a kid that, um, for one reason or another, I, I really loved the Cowboys, you know, so I got my headboard, I had RR uh, up there for Roy Rogers, those, those of you who are not young people, Roy Rogers over my headboard, and then the other thing was that I had a little hat, <laughs> Not great hat, but a little cowboy hat with a string, you know, so it stays under your chin. And then uh, when you're blistering along, walking. And uh, and then I had a gun, but I was good because I'm left-handed, so I can't draw a gun like you know you do when you're on the streets. So <laughs> I had my holster backwards so I could draw across my body. And I learned this watching Disneyland uh, uh, because Texas John Slaughter was a uh, Texas Ranger who was left-handed, and he wore his gun across, and I saw that and I went, I am so there. So I, I wore my gun across so I could quick draw, you know. Now the thing was, Texas John Slaughter actually was African-American, but Walt would have nothing to do with that, so he made him a white guy for, all, for everybody, which is a whole nother issue, but, um, but anyway, he was my hero, and uh, I only lacked one thing in life, and that was, the uh, chaps, you know, <laughs> the leather chaps, so that I could ride through the sagebrush in my dreams, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, and my chaps. So I did, uh, thing. I wrote to Santa, I mailed it to the North Pole, I said, I don't need anything, just this one thing would be great, you know, I've got everything else that I ever need, just the chaps. And um, got that sent away, everything's taken care of, and then my sister Florence and I went to the Whittier Quad where Santa was actually there in person with helpers or elves, I guess. And, uh, and we were there and uh, I got to sit on the gentleman's lap and uh, he asked me, so what do you want for Christmas? I thought, he's, he's kidding me. He's just kidding me. I mean, he got my letter. <laughs> <laughs> he's just playing with me now. Uh, for the sake of the others, probably. And uh, so uh, I said, oh, you know, just the chaps, that's all. 
And he, and he gave me kind of a weird physical look and gave me a candy cane and off I went. And so, uh, but I was taking care of it. I had this all ready. And uh, I just was so confident. I was like one of the most confident young people in the world. And uh, so Christmas Day came, Christmas morning. And we got the usual thing. You can get up early before the parents and get the stocking with like an orange in it. Or, uh, it was that's thrills, you know. And uh, but then it came time around the tree, and I saw a box over there wrapped up. And instead of racing over like my two brothers and my sister who were like tearing shredding things, you know, I just sat there and watched it. I said, "This is so good." And I waited and waited. Finally, my mom said, right, "Aren't you going to open your present, Tony?" I went, "Okay." So I went over and opened it up. A lot of tissue paper stuff. Reached out in there, and it wasn't soft leather. It wasn't pliable. It was a like metal. And it was a Tonka truck, a dump truck. And uh, that's when I got introduced to um, Christmas expectations mm -hmm. and how there's something elementally disappointing in Christmas. And that stayed with me. And, uh, and you know, so I sat there crying next to the tree and uh, have been there ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so, so you know, you've all heard the Christmas stories and we uh, we do the Advent and the different ways that uh, people prepare for Christ to be born in the world. And, and so um, one of the people who was integrally related to the Christmas story was John, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, right? And he, um, uh, Elizabeth, his mom, Aunt Elizabeth, Aunt Lizzie, was uh, pregnant when Mary came to see her. And it was, so they were born almost the same time. And so they grew up together, John, Jesus, John. And, and it was John who first announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God uh, coming into the world, who baptized him, uh, who pointed people to Jesus, and um, and basically was the, the scripture that we heard today, you guys read, uh, um, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That was always applied to, that was John's message. Uh, wise, strong, courageous, uh, uh, blunt, and announcing Jesus coming. So then when you look at Matthew chapter 11, um, verse 2, uh, when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus said, go back and report to him what you hear and see. Then he quotes from Isaiah the prophet, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those uh, who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Happy is the person who does not fall away on account of me. And some translations say, happy is the, those who are not offended by me. Who don't take offense at me. And I thought, wow, that, that's a good Advent passage, because what do you expect? John's message was, oh man, when the Messiah comes, you better get ready, because he, you know, he's coming, and he's ticked off, and uh, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, and he's got, oh, he had a great, and the axe is at the root of the tree, and it's going to cut down the tree, and it's going to be thrown into the fire, it's going to be burnt. When Jesus gets here, that's what's going to happen. Now, he's sitting in prison, he's about to be executed, and he's thinking, where did I go wrong? Probably not that. He's probably thinking, where did Jesus go so wrong? Why is Jesus not doing what I told everybody he would do? I went out on a limb, and I was very clear that this is what he would do, and he's going to establish his kingdom, and he's going to rule with power and authority, and he's going to destroy all those who are enemies of him, and, and he's going to divide everything up, He's not doing any of that. So we sent them to say, are you the one, or should we look for somebody else? It's kind of sarcastic, really, kind of the way 
family members talk to each other. And uh, Jesus said, go back and tell them what you see. Just tell them what you see. What do you hear? I think that, that John the Baptist was having a little bit of the disappointment in Christmas himself. He had wanted something, he had planned on it, he had prepared for it, he had prepared people for it, he had set, his whole life had been set up to, to prepare the way for the Lord, and now the Lord wasn't fulfilling his expectation, right? Wasn't acting the way he told everybody to do that. And it's kind of embarrassing for John, because now people are going, hey, you said he was going to be doing this, and he's not doing it, so uh, what, did you get it all wrong? John's going, man, this is embarrassing. People are turning on me now. Well, what do we do with our expectations? Um, I don't recommend anybody do what I do, which is just lower them, you know, <laughs> expect nothing. And then, you know, if you're really a negative, pessimist person like I am, you know I am, Dave, you know, if you're this way, every good thing that happens is a surprise. You know, I'm always surprised by good things because when the bad things come, I'm not surprised at all. Of course, that's what happens, you know. And, and so I'm all prepared for everything to go wrong and then something wonderful happens. It's like, whoa, caught off guard, you know. But I don't recommend that. Although you join me if you want. <laughs> you know, everybody can do that. Uh, but maybe we're not supposed to base our life on the expectations that we form. And that, because we, we set ourselves up in different ways. Then what do we? How do we prepare for Christ to break into our world in a radical way and, and to transform? How, how do we prepare for Christmas if it's not through our expectations? Well, there's another word that's very similar to expectations, and that's hope. Hope is different than expectations. Uh, and hope is not just positive thinking. I don't care what the owner of the Orlando Magic says. Uh, uh, there's, there's a rationality to hope. There's a realism in hope. Uh, that's why in the, in the Bible it says, it says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope you have within you. It's reasonable. So how do we move from ex expectations and being let down or being, you know, fulfilling them and feeling confident? How do we move from that game to a reasonable hope in which we look at, at our life and the lives of the people around us and, and our world and, and we say, I can live in hope because Christ is going to radically break into my world. And he may do something totally different than what I'm expecting. He may be in my life completely different than I was told he would be when I first said, Lord, come into my life. It may be completely different. But I have hope that he'll be there and, and it will be good. It may not be what I expect, but it'll be good. And... Uh, so I think about this, and, and I go, um, how can we move from our expectations to hope? Oh, you were all told things when you, when you first became a Christian. If you think back on those times, if, if, if you've already uh, asked Christ to come into your life, think back on those times, and you were told things, some of which might have come true. But I bet there's a lot of it that didn't. A lot of what we were told, you know, when you ask Christ into your life, here's what's going to happen. A lot of that scenario never actually took place. Some people, when they realize it doesn't take place, they go, well, forget it, I'm out of here. I mean, I've got friends through the years, I go, you know, what happened to you? You know, you, you had much more faith than me. You, you had much more, you knew the Bible better. You far better a preacher, that's for sure. That's not hard. And then, uh, and now you're like a pagan. 
What happened? And almost always, you know what they say? Well, it just didn't work out that way for me. It didn't work for me. I go, what do you mean? And then they tell me, well, this happened and that happened and then I prayed for this, it didn't happen and that. So I walked away. Maybe you felt like walking away. It didn't happen the way you thought it would. They lied to you. The very people who, who encouraged you to accept Christ into your life lied to you. That's a tough one to come up to grips with. But we don't have to walk away. And even if we did walk away, guess who followed us? Yeah, Jesus. Still right there. You love me now? And uh, saying, let me be in you on my terms, not on your terms. Let me be Lord of your life, as Lord of your life, not the imaginary one that you thought up and hoped that I would become, but the real. So why don't you have a relationship with me that's not based on what you think it ought to be, but it's based on a real relationship. Now, anybody ever been in a real relationship? No? <laughs> I'm not drunk. <laughs> I'm not done yet. No, I mean, if you've been in a real relationship, isn't it wonderful how harmonious it is all the time? And it's just so fun, and, and you never disagree about anything, and you're just feeling blessed to be with them, right? Every minute of the day, you just wake up so filled with happiness and glee. It's like, whoa, I'm in this honest relationship with you. And they're probably feeling exactly the same way, right? Woo Aren't I lucky to be with you? You know? <laughs> but that's what we do with Jesus. That's what we do in the church. Over all the years I've been in the church, the people go, well, I, you know, I, and I was going to have this good life, and everything was going to prosper, and Jesus was going to bless me, and everybody's going to love me, and, 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 and they don't. Yeah, because you're kind of a jerk. <laughs> you know, I mean, really. <laughs> and I understand that. But a real relationship is not all that stuff, is it? A real relationship is growing and loving and choosing to be together in spite of all around that stuff. When we're disappointed, when we're not disappointed. <clears throat> Right, the new book, I, I'm going to tell you a story from the new book. Um, uh, it's coming out in June, so you, you'll forget about it. So buy it and read it and be surprised. So uh, a while back, a few years ago, a young couple came to see me. I don't remember if I told you this. A young couple came to see me. I would married them at the very beginning of my ministry. It had been like 25 years, something like that, 30 years. And uh, they came to see me, and we sat down, and we were talking, and, and all of a sudden, uh, we reminisced a little bit, and then they started going, you know, well, it's been really hard, you know. Uh, we got pregnant, and then lost the baby, and then, uh, then we had, had a couple of kids, and then one of them died. And then, um, well, right now, you know, I'm losing my job, and I don't know how we're going to do it. We may lose our house. and. Um, and they just go through this whole litany of stuff they've been through. And then, and then the, the husband said, man, we didn't sign up for this when you married us. <laughs> I know. Uh, I didn't know what to say, so I mean, I said, oh, man, I'm really sorry. It was a hard, hard life. And uh, didn't sign up for this. So I got up, I went over to my files, and I, I used to keep files of all the couples I'd married over the years. And I pulled their file out. And I went, wait a minute. Your wedding vow, you said, in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow, in times of plenty and times of want, that's a richer and poorer thing, you know, you 
did sign up for this, so shut up. <laughs> Come see the loving pastor. <laughs> I mean, what the heck? That's exactly what we signed up for. And then why are we going, oh, whoa, look at this. Because it's not what we expected. I expected, you know, it's Eileen's fault. I expected when I got there, you know, in good times, in wealth and prosperity, and in good health. Isn't that really what we were signing up for? And then, she's in a wheelchair with constant pain, her son's mentally ill, I got cancer. Uh, we've, we've actually had a few arguments over the years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Exactly what we signed up for. Exactly what we signed up for. That's a real relationship. So, why would it be different with Jesus? When, when, when Christ comes into our world, and when we invite him into our lives to be our Lord and our Savior, we say, we're going to walk with you, and you live in us, and you empower us, and you lead us, and you grow us, and you love through us. When all of that is happening, why do we think it's going to be peppy? It's going to be real life. And the funny thing is, Jesus knows that and is still wanting to break into our world. He knows what you're like. I've tried to keep him from knowing what I'm like, but he's watched the videos, so he kind of knows. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, he's saying, I, I chose you. I choose you. I want to be in your life through it all, through all the twists and turns and ups and downs. Let me love you. Through it all. And that's where our hope comes from. Because he doesn't give up on us and he doesn't uh, run away or hide or cover his eyes when things get bad. He's right there. Just let him love us through it all. So, I have a homework assignment for you 21 days. 21 days. The next 21 days. Uh, I'm asking you, I'm telling you, I'm requiring you uh, between now and Christmas, I want you to uh, take a piece of paper and I want you to carry it with you. Take it with you. With your pocket, and I want you to write down different expectations that you have as you discover them along your day. It might be one or two, it might be 30, uh, who knows, you know, just keep writing them down. And then I want you to, on the side, say, Lord, what do you want to do in this? What do you want to do in my life? I'm expecting this, good or bad, doesn't matter. Where are you in that? How are you going to love me through this? and start to see between now and Christmas Day all the ways that Christ can and must and hopefully will break into your world and surprise you with joy. Now the problem is we don't notice it unless we write it down. That's, that's the problem. So you go, okay, ah, oh, yeah, John said write it down. Hey, hey, I'm not going to do that, you know. Because yeah, yeah, then you're going to get to Christmas, and guess what? You don't know. Jack. <laughs> I don't have to tell you his last name. <laughs> but, uh, but if you write it down, you'll start to see it. You'll start to see the pattern. You'll start to see how Jesus wants to enter your life and love you through a lot and you'll see yourself in a new way, and you'll see your life in a new way. And on Christmas morning, you'll have reason for joy. A reasonable joy. And a reasonable hope. And an incredibly reasonable love.